Welcome to Next Up Accessories, where we connect your next up and vehicle personalization to make you more money and happier customers. What is vehicle personalization? That is a process for your showroom to present customization to each of your car buyers. They uh, helps you to increase your paycheck, uh, gives your customers the car they want, and it will skyrocket your CSI. According to our friend and very successful sales professional, Eric Gonzalez, if your car sale doesn't touch every part of the dealership, you're not doing your job. That's from Eric, not me. So, uh, hey, how do we have the car sale touch every part of the job, every part of the dealership? That's vehicle personalization. If you'd like to learn more about vehicle personalization on every car deal, this is the podcast for you. For more about vehicle personalization, contact us at insigniagroup.com. If you are an Insignia customer, uh, we'd like to thank you for your business and ask you to join our blog. Subscribe, uh, let us know what you think, comment on social media. We're always uh, open for uh, some conversation on LinkedIn. So uh, we want to thank Side Hustle for the use of their song, uh, Work With What You Got. Very appropriate for these times. Uh, you can find Side Hustle at SideHustleTheBand.com. They're coming out with a new album later in this year, so uh, check them out. Uh, so let's dive into Next Up Accessories, shall we? We have an awesome show today. Uh, I am super excited. We, uh, I, I love to interview uh, folks from the dealership world. I love to interview folks from uh, the manufacturer world. And when we can bring on someone uh, from the manufacturing world and talk to us about everything that happens behind the scenes, it just it's very exciting. So we are going to uh, bring on one of our guests who is from Jaguar Land Rover, uh, one of the partners for Insignia. Uh, have you ever thought about the process of actually what vehicles are uh, launched in uh, the US market? Um, it's gotta be a daunting task. And have you ever thought about the behind the scenes people who make these decisions and decide which car to bring in, if it's a European car, which car not to bring in, no pressure or anything. So we are going to talk to Rob Filipovich today. And uh, Rob is the behind the scenes guy for Jaguar Land Rover. So no pressure uh, at all in terms of uh, what they bring into the country, what cars they sell. Rob has spent eight years at Jaguar and Land Rover in North America, um, and his top job is really to determine uh, the, the product portfolio that comes into the US. What's cool about it, and we're gonna talk about this too, is recently Jaguar Land Rover moved the vehicle personalization and accessories under the product portfolio, under the vehicle product portfolio. So that's a really cool thing we're gonna talk about. Uh, Rob has also spent uh, seven additional years at BMW, so he really understands the luxury brand uh, in the luxury segment. Uh, so we are super excited. So uh, Cameron, uh, would you do me a favor and bring Rob onto the show? There he is. Hey, David. Rob. Hey, how are you, David? I am excellent. Please introduce yourself and fill in a little bit more context. Yeah, well, I, I think you covered it, a huge portion of it. Um, obviously, for me, spent a lot in my entire career in the automotive industry. Um, got to got to work for a couple of fantastic brands, um, and and a, a huge portion of that on the on the product uh, planning and, and product strategy side. Um, but obviously, the the thing probably that shapes me even more is is time I spent actually in, in franchise development at the start of my career and and, and also in, in customer experience um, and, and working with the, the CRC team and all the dealer teams on, on that side of the business. Um, so I, I, it's been a, it's been a great ride so far and, and even better with some of the products and things that you were talking about. Fantastic. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover, but the first thing that we obviously have to talk about, uh, especially if you're watching the video portion of Next Up Accessories, um, I'm pretty sure that the JLR offices in Mawa don't really look like that behind you with all the stuffed animals. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, try, I try to keep my desk very homey. <laughs> <laughs> So we appreciate you uh, joining with us today, especially in these crazy weird times. Uh, we're broadcasting from our office, but there's hardly anybody here. And I guess you all also in the uh, in the corporate side of Jaguar Land Rover are also kind of dealing with very unprecedented times. So 
let, let's lead off with that. How, how has Jaguar Land Rover uh, adopted to these kind of crazy times? And, and, uh, and what, what's the next sort of six months look like? Yeah, well, I think one of the most obvious, as as you pointed out, is obviously we've been we've been all working from home now since March, um, and and so the the digitization of our office, um, in this case, we're in the middle of a move, so this is this is my <laughs> daughter's room. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the irony is, it's it's that flexibility of of working wherever you need to, whenever you need to, um, and and keeping the teams connected digitally as much as possible, both both with our, within ourselves. Um, but also with the dealer network, um, I think being the critical piece too. Um, and that's kind of been one of the biggest focuses for us is making sure that everyone just con continues communicating. Um, even if sometimes that feels like over communication, um, yeah. no better way to, to try to keep connected, um, with everyone so that we can keep the business going. Um, and I think that's kind of been one of the biggest themes out throughout the last, so I'd say six months and into the next six months that you talked about, which is, um, just what this is, how this has forced all of us into, I think, really expediting a lot of the digitization that was already going on. Um, we especially seen see all our, our all our retailer partners have have really dove dove head on into the whole online sales process. Um, a lot more support on the on the service side as well, in terms of. Um, digital kind of appointment booking, but then also the, all of the pickup and delivery services. Um, so it really has been, I think, that that piece of, I think if there's a, a, a good note to bring out of COVID, um, I think it's, it's kind of really elevated the customer experience in a really rapid fashion um, in, in, I think, a direction that everyone knew it was already going. Um, but I think it's brought it there for a lot of us a lot quicker. I couldn't agree more. We're seeing exactly the same thing. Um, it, it feels like the industry has been kicked forward about three to five years from the standpoint of the adoption of technology. And quite frankly, the adoption of uh, the retailers in the way that they normally did business, they were completely fine with changing that in a heartbeat. So, and what, you know, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we had a consulting division and, you know, we would spend hours trying to get in front of general managers and sales managers and lots of time standing at the desk waiting for somebody to say hello and let's, you know, let's talk. I'm too busy. I'm doing a car deal. And now we are able to schedule time, get their focused attention over the phone or video chat. And we're finding our, our consulting is 10 times better and more effective in a way that they wouldn't have adopted this way in the past, right? I mean, we couldn't have said, we're gonna do all virtual consulting. They would have been like, oh, I'm too busy for that. Well, now there's no choice. So now they have to. And so I, I would say that there is a, a major plus out of uh, all of this. And that is, it, it just feels like we're, we've moved forward several years in the adoption of, of technology, so. Yeah, and I, th I think at the end of the day, the Honestly, the, the industry and, and at the end of the day, the consumer will be a lot better off for it um, as we look forward into the future. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how you got into the car business and, um, you know, what a little bit of your 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 history into the car business. Yeah, um, I, me getting into the car business goes back to when I was probably like my daughter's age, um, nice. which was just an ob obsession with all things car. Um, and, and so that's where it, it started from. Um, I, I was never actually intending to go into the auto industry. Um, but after it was actually after a internship, um, with BMW and actually one before that, even with, um, a, a joint venture between GM and Suzuki, um, that then I decided, well, actually I can take all of my education and combine it with all things car. Um, that sounds like the, an even better path forward. Um, nice. so, so fortunately it's been kind of that combination of, of taking something that I wanted to do from a career perspective, matching it up with one of my passions and, and here we are today. Now is your background in engineering or is your background in, um, sort of marketing product development? Yeah. Or? Um, business and finance. Um, okay. yeah, I, was, I was actually a math minor for a little bit and then, and then it got into financial planning as a specialization before I said, neither of those are really for me and, and just took all of that learning and then tried to apply it to this industry. 
Excellent, excellent, awesome. Um, and uh, I, we knew we kind of studied up on you a little bit, and you have a background in the Canadian automotive industry. What kind of differences are there in the you know coming up through the Canadian auto industry and and then moving into the the U.S. industry? Is there is there much difference? Yeah, um, scale's definitely one. Um, I think that's, <laughs> that's unavoidable. <laughs> um, I think there's there's definitely some variations in consumer taste. Um, and, and even within Canada, you have this huge variation from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because you actually start to get where there's certain places in Canada that have a good similarity with certain places in the U.S. as well. Um, and I think that just kind of speaks to that great diversity of both the U.S. market as well as the Canadian market. Um, if we try to paint all the states, all the cities with the same brush, we've got a big problem on our hands. Um, and then I think the other big difference for the Canadian market is you definitely have a little bit more of the, the European influence um, through parts of it. And I think you saw that probably most prevalent in terms of some of the smart, small car demand in, in Canada, uh, as well as where the demand for diesel was in Canada for, for a number of years, um, that it was kind of almost a little bit of that bridge between Europe and the US. Yeah. Um, so I, I think those are the, some of the main ones. Um, but I think in terms of a lot of the other automotive tastes, in terms of um, types of products and, and kind of expectations in terms of what the what the vehicle brings the, the consumer expectations around kind of digital capabilities in the car those are very much on on par between the countries very cool so let's get uh directly into what you do now for jaguar land rover and um your uh your title is product uh manager correct for the the brand yeah, so I'm, I'm the director of product for Jag and Land Rover. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so what does that mean? You know, um, so, so that covers just about anything product related. So um, I've got a fa fantastic team um, that really kind of uh, helps steer the ship for me. Um, but it's really looking at what are the products that, that the U.S. And, and the Canadian consumers need and want, um, whether that's the, the vehicles and the nameplates themselves, um, what features they want and expect out of them, um, what accessories they want and expect out of them, and, and all of them, the, the pricing that goes along with that as well. Um, well so you don't have a very long white beard <clears throat> and a hat, you know, inside. <laughs> so uh, you, obviously you're not uh, sort of some sage uh, seance. But I, what, uh, how do you make those determinations? I mean, what, what truly goes into making the determination between one vehicle and another? I, honestly, I, I think it's it's keeping that tight pulse with the co with the consumer, um, whether that's through the direct connections we have um, with with the end end buyer and, and owners, um, or if it's the all the all the third party data that's out there, um, and then most importantly through the retailers, um, whether that's through our retailer cabinet or the direct feedback um, from all our partners across the across the continent. Um, so I think that's the the critical piece. It, if we don't have that pulse on what the consumer wants, then we're in trouble. Um, yeah. I, I can't be produced. I could certainly try to kind of define the cars that I want for myself, but that doesn't mean that <laughs> we'll sell any of them. <laughs> so basically what you're saying is Jack and Rover lineup is what Rob wants. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so it's got to be a mountain of data. I mean, it's got to be just a, an unbelievable. So what are some of the data points that you give us as, as examples of the things that you look at, such as, I mean, like surveys? I mean, when you say, you know, the, the vehicle and then you're talking about features, you're also saying, well, you know, do you want a nav and do you want a, you know, 12 inch nav screen or an eight inch nav screen? Do you want heated and cooled seats or just heated seats? I mean, just there's got to be so much data. Uh, how do you weed through all that data? Yeah, there's, there's a tremendous amount. It's the, from from what we have internally through, I think, the, this, obviously all the big players between Strategic Vision, IHS Market, um, JD Power, all the like. Um, so you've got that kind of mountain growing and growing. Mm -hmm. um, we try to do a lot in terms of just watching trends too. Um, whether that be through um, CES, SEMA, um, any of, uh, of those other avenues as well, mm -hmm. um, to see where con consumer demand's going and interest. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's just kind of trying to combine all those data points. 
um, which is difficult because there's a tremendous amount there. Um, and that's kind of where we've obviously got some some great people on the team that can that can help us dive through that, leveraging some of those partners as well to give us more insights um, and then kind of building out more of our own data team uh, that can help us help guide us and, and give us some of those um, help help control the compass for us, I'll say, um, in terms of where things are going and what people are interested in wanting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those um, conversations that when you are in a retailer and you get to know uh, the sales team uh, that's there on a daily basis, trying to move move the metal, if you will, um, there will be comments like, "Boy, the factory just has no idea what they're doing." You know, <laughs> "Oh my gosh, can you believe this?" Can you believe this, the standard option, blah, blah. So I, I whereas on the one hand, um, you know, you can empathize with people that have to uh, move those products. And then on the other side, it's just, there's a, I see there's a huge disconnect. Uh, and and it, this came front and center. We were working with another OEM who did a presentation. We were part of that presentation and the, the audience who were all, parts managers and service directors, they said, you know, it's ridiculous. You don't even have a, 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 a roof rack and set of crossbars for this most popular vehicle. I mean, come on, how hard is that? And the product manager for the brand said, well, let me put it this way. Are you willing to spend 10, are you willing to, to sell $10 million worth of crossbars? Because that's how much it will, cost to bring it all in. And he had this whole answer and the room was silent because nobody thought about, wow, that, you know, yeah, you're right. That is really a logistical thing to get that product actually on the vehicle, then in the store, then, you know, sold. And so you have to sell a lot of it to justify actually doing it. So oh, yeah. I, love, I love trying to bridge the gap here between that perception that, you know, you're like this saying, yes, the defender, you know, and whereas no, you're not, you're actually using a lot of data. You're using a, a, a lot of data points to try to bring together the best strategy. So I, for sure. I, and then, and I think that was a, a big piece on kind of where, where some of the costs to consider it. Obviously we'd love to just be able to do exactly what um, the, the customer wants every time. Um, but then there's also that counterbalance of um, safety regulations, emissions regulations, um, the actual development costs, crash testing, all these other pieces. So um, it's kind of that critically important piece of getting all of this thinking upstream so that we can really think about it within the core vehicle design in the first place, um, because it's one of those, if, it, if you treat it as an afterthought, um, it makes it that much more difficult in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of integrating and, and having things available for people. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's one hell of a puzzle um, <laughs> that we try to put together every day, um, but, but it's an exciting one is my view on it too. Well, so let's let's talk about that, and then I want to uh, I I, I want to get to the defender. But let's talk. You since you brought it up, um, Jaguar Land Rover recently is uh, did is doing uh, and has done what I have seen several other OEMs. Not all of them, but there's definitely a trend, and the trend is moving vehicle personalization, moving accessories, say accessory parts, out of after sales. Uh, and out of parts and service and putting it more on the product side, more on the variable side, more on the sales and, and integrating it in with the development of the vehicle. Um, talk about your strategy and how that came about for Jaguar Land Rover, because that's a recent thing that's in the last you know two years that you've made that move. Talk about why you made that move and, and what you're expecting to happen from that move. Yeah, it, 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 it's really it goes to that piece that um, we were just hitting on, which is that side of um, accessories and customization are, are really an extension of the vehicle. Um, and, and the best way for us to, to give people more options and, and make them serve the consumer better and make them easier to fit as well is that we bring them upstream within the original concept development of the vehicle. Um, it's that, that difficulty if you, if you wait for all of it until the vehicle's actually there, now you're trying to find and force places to, to whether it be for mounting points, 
um, kind of bolt holes, whatever the case may be, right. where the more that that can actually be brought upstream into the, the core vehicle design, engineering and development, all the better. Um, and so that's kind of where we tried to uh, and we continue to work on, on aligning it so that it's really one process mm -hmm. um, as opposed to design and build the vehicle and then accessories coming after. Um, yeah. which just makes it way more difficult, way more expensive um, and, and make it harder to deliver what the customer wants at the end. Um, so that's really been the core of that strategy um, that we're working through and, and trying to see how we can even further build upon that uh, for future model years, future generations of vehicles. And well, Defender is probably one of the first that really kind of embraced that um, as a whole within the business. Yeah, I think the, the important factor that I want to highlight for our audience is that that ultimately means that vehicle personalization, accessories, customization to the customer is really what we're talking about, is really part of the product you are selling. So it's not an afterthought. It's not something that, you know, we'll try to figure it out later. It's really designed to be from the very uh, beginnings of the vehicle all the way through manufacturing and into the showroom. Well, now it's really a part of that vehicle and it's been designed to be a part of that vehicle. And I think that's one of the points that uh, we try to highlight in our consulting is look, you know, the, the manufacturer is, uh, is building the ability for you to customize this vehicle and building a, a ability to customize the vehicle for your customer and allowing your customer, if I'm talking to a, a, a salesperson. So it, it's not an after, yeah, we'll just do it if we, if we think about it, you know, it's really part of the whole process. So let's use that to, to um, you know, to, to talk about the defender, which uh, has gotten a, a tremendous amount of press and, and good reviews. Um, talk about how uh, that was to bring that vehicle back uh, from sort of the archives. Uh, see, people seem to really enjoy the fact when you you bring a nameplate back from from history and say, "Yep, this is the new Defender." Uh, we're seeing that around other other places. So, how was that? It's, it's unbelievably exciting. Um, it's uh, probably one of the most difficult things around because it was such a long development process. Um, and we couldn't talk about it for years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and there was a lot to want to talk about. Um, so, yeah. so I think from that end, it was it was it was a rather painful number of years. Um, <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, it was kind of tremendously exciting. Um, and that that notion of kind of really, at least for for North America, reviving a nameplate that hadn't existed for twenty three plus years here. Um, to, to think about it in that context, yeah. Um, which is also the, the challenge of it being that it's a vehicle with a tremendous number of fans out there. Um, so how do you live up to and exceed the expectations of all of those fans? Um, so it, that, that was kind of another big difficulty in, in trying to do it and get it right. Um, and, and is what I think probably one of the, those key reasons on, why it took the amount of time that it did from when we first started showing Defender concepts early on in, in this decade. Um, but I think it, obviously the end result is ex exceptionally exciting um, in, in terms of especially how it, I think for me at least lives up to and the Defender name um, at the end of the day between the design, the overall capability, especially off-roading, um, but then thoroughly modernizing that so you actually have an off-roader you want to drive on the road and the highway um right. and it's like and, and a fully digital um off-roader as well in terms of all of the integration with um what we have from a infotainment perspective um what the all the capabilities with software over the air um, spotify in the car still all the carplay android auto wireless charging on and on and on um, and all the driver assistance systems and safety systems so it was that side of and kind of i'll let everyone be the judge of it but for us it was how do you take the defender rethink it for this decade mm -hmm. and then just amplify it and, and make it even better in every way possible um, so it was it was an exciting challenge and what role specifically did you play in all of that process as the uh, the director of product? So, yeah, are you, so were you saying, hey, it's got to have this, this, this in, in those early concepts? Or 
you know, where you just sort of get, did you get the information later and say, yep, this will work or this won't work? I mean, what, how, how did that, how does that play out? How's that dynamic? Yeah, so it's a combination. So for us, a, a lot of it's feeding in kind of, here's what, here's what our consumers need. Um, and here's where some of those gaps or differences are versus the European markets, Asian markets, um, the UK, and, and ensuring that we have that for, for our customers. Um, so that was, that's probably the, the biggest component there. Um, and, and then making sure that kind of all the feature that comes along with it is up to people's expectations. Um, and so that's kind of the, the key for my team is again, just being that, that voice for, for North American consumers back into the development process and all the other teams globally. Um, so that kind of our, our needs and well, our consumers needs get met. So uh, the Defender also had a pretty good lineup, probably your most extensive lineup for accessories. So oh, talk, yeah. talk about the, the thinking behind that. What, what was the thinking behind that? Yeah, we're, we're headed towards 170 or so accessories on it. Right. Um, and, and the thinking of it was, and this kind of goes to the history of Defender too, where the product over the decades meant so many different things to so many different people. So if you think about it, it was a tool for kind of post-war era. It was a mm -hmm. tool for farmers. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, it was used all around Hollywood and by the royal family um, <laughs> as a form of transportation. Um, so when you look at kind of that spectrum of uses and all the different things Defender did for people and all the different things that it meant for them, it means that you have to have a, a huge amount of variation and capability for it. And that was kind of the concept with the accessory strategy too, is whether it's someone that wants it to, to really use it as a more utilitarian tool, having things available for them to help with kind of just carrying stuff um, or, mm -hmm. or having that flexibility to just wash things out and, and do things around, um, whether it be the farm or, or out on the, on the ranch or wherever else. Um, and then the flip side of it is anyone that's using it more for call it family purposes. How do we have the things available that actually help the family use the vehicle um, and, and kind of make it more convenient in their day-to-day -day lives? Um, and that was, so that was really kind of when you look at the accessory offering, it's kind of having that breadth of, hey, I'm going to the jungle and I need the things to help me get through it. Or I'm going to um, the, the school line and I need the help to, to kind of make sure I've got all the things that the kids want for um, getting there and, and then any of their activities that they have afterwards. <laughs> Very much so. And so it probably plays into the packages that Jaguar Land Rover came out with for, uh, for the Defender. So there was the, uh, the Explorer, the Adventure, the Country, and the Urban. So I think, you know, you're sort of hitting on that spectrum. Um, what, from a factory perspective, what is the reasoning for doing packages like this? Um, really, really make things a little easier um, for for consumers, um, salespeople, um, the the people um, controlling the, the inventory at the at the dealer, and, and even mm -hmm. through our pipeline as well. Um, so the end, I, the end purpose really is for the consumer. If they if they've got certain things that they do or that they know that their vehicle equipped for, these were kind of turnkey um, solutions for them. So that it's kind of like right out right out of the gate you've got the vehicle ready for some of the, the core things that you might want to be doing um, obviously all those things are still available a la carte and and for people to install throughout their life with the vehicle too um, but that was really the key idea was that day you take delivery kind of tick this box and, and you're ready to go on on that adventure you want what however extreme it might be Right. And then a uh, great strategy there for um, your showroom, the, the actual showroom itself. I mean, uh, you could do one or two of those packages on, you know, your your display defender and uh, make it stand out uh, because you've got that package on it. Uh, make it something that's different than the rest of your inventory. So um, I think those are also, you know, really good ways uh, sort of speaking out there to the audience, really good ways to use these packages in order in, in any packages really for from any OEMs to differentiate vehicles and differentiate inventory. So yeah, and, and I think it's um, for a lot of people, it's how do you make something tangible, um, mm -hmm. right? Versus 
um, looking at it in a catalog or, or online, um, being able to actually see, touch, um, understand kind of how it functions um, becomes so critical. And I think that's kind of where we've often have been having those discussions with, with our, our partners out there on how do you actually put more of that in front of people um, as it really kind of then helps make it click for them that, yeah, that's something they need. Um, and even more so kind of motivating and, and you've probably seen at some of our events, actually having them, all, all the vehicles with actually bikes, kayaks, skis, absolutely the, the lifestyle stuff in, in the trunk, any of the gear in the trunk as well. I, again, to put more context around it for people where it's kind of like, Hey, I bike. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think that's that key bit is kind of really helping connect the vehicle to people's lives more. Yeah. Well, what's neat too is uh, one of our, and I'll, I'll kind of toot our little horn here, but uh, we've been able to configure those visually on as packages on on the vehicles in the configurator. So that's yeah. that was a neat uh, add for us too. Uh, we didn't have. We had one other OEM that we did that for too, and that it, it's really come out well. And uh, it's a great way to highlight those all together uh, it, as a, okay, one and none. Yep, this is everything I wanted in terms of really making this vehicle my own. So absolutely good, good stuff there. So, um, so yeah, so uh, uh, one of our questions here was, uh, and we've kind of touched a, 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 around it a little bit, but I'd be interested in how getting back sort of the data driven, you'd really do have, you know, very two different audiences, kind of a polar, you know, the, that adventure family, let's call it. And then the urban, you know, sort of drive around town, pick up the kids sort of uh, family. Um, how do you use data to kind of decide which accessories to offer for both of those, you know, those, those, uh, kind of spectrums. Yeah, I think mean, that goes you get the data or what what data do you use? Is it previous sales? Is it sur again, surveys? I mean, just curious. Yeah, it's a it's a mixture, obviously. Um, past sales on, on other product lines as far as where consumer interest was. Um, again, I, I think I mentioned some of the trend spotting out there, um, whether it be through um, through SEMA and all the great data that they have as well. Um, and then even just kind of from, from the, the show and, and the presence there, um, looking at what, what people are asking for, um, whether that be the, the consumer directly or, or again, our, our retailers, um, but because they're uh, the closest to the consumer. So I like think trying to listen to where, where are we missing things and, and what's, what's needed. Um, and then, and then quickly also looking at, um, what the people start putting on their vehicles that we maybe don't have. Um, and, and kind of keeping in touch and in tune with that um, so that we can try to deliver more. Um, and, and I think the last piece is um, just trying to think through a, a day in the life of a lot of the users um, and kind of, okay, how do we make that experience through a day of trail riding more convenient? Um, what are the tools that, that can help with that um, so that you can kind of, I think, get loaded up easier, get out to the trail easier, finish your day easier. Um, I think if, if an accessory, I think, isn't helping someone along the way, then it's a challenge um, and, and kind of you have to question its purpose. Um, but I think the key there is just having things that help people live, the, live day to day or, or live, help live within some of the activities that they're doing. Well, and again, it goes back to that human element, you know, uh, you and your team, you you all have lives and kids, obviously, and you know you're doing things, and so you're bringing in also your life experience into those decisions too, uh, in terms of what makes your life easier. You know, traveling around town or um, you know that kind of thing. So I think that's yeah, absolutely a part of it as well. Yep. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, let's talk about uh, Jaguar. Um, and uh, certainly, I think one of the, the hit vehicles for, for uh, you all uh, was definitely the F-Pace and uh, how that was received, uh, how that uh, did really well. Um, talk about the accessory strategy there uh, in terms of what, what you were trying to offer to that, uh, that Jaguar customer who's really used to vehicles, you know, really used to vehicles, really used to cars, uh, you know, sport and, and um, you know, that luxury feel of a Jaguar 
uh, sedan. Uh, and now you bring out uh, the F pace, you know, talk about how that transition went. Yeah, it was. Um, I think I think the transition of the F pace went went fantastic um, because I think at the core we were able to to bring an SUV to market that really held true to the brand um, in terms of design performance. Um, so that was the the vehicle itself was kind of the easy part. Um, I think when when you talk kind of again on the, the accessory side, as you as you asked, um, it was again what are the what are the lifestyles? What are the people that that are going to be buying this vehicle doing? Um, and that's where, obviously, as with a number of our cars, the, the roof accessories become critically important. Um, we, we have kind of a consumer base that really over indexes on, on things like cycling, skiing, um, snowboarding. So how do we make sure that we've got the things there that help them um, kind of move along? Same with travel. Um, so when it comes to things like roof boxes, I know it's not the, the sexiest of accessories, but it's one of those. It helps, it helps people with, the, with their travels. Um, so that all became important. Um, we also know on, on the Jag side, um, design is a huge, huge um, reason for purchase. Um, so again, how can we give some extra design customization with more things as far as um, carbon fiber parts and, and the like on, on the Jaguar vehicles um, to help people kind of, again, customize the exteriors, interiors a little bit more. Um, so that's where it really was with on on, on that, that brand and the Jaguar brand for us, it's really about adding to the convenience of ownership um, and, and making the vehicle easier to use for, for any of those kind of activities that they might be going on. Um, and then offering, trying to offer some things that can help um, differentiate the style of the car for, for the individual. Great. Excellent. So uh, let's talk about the XE, which, um, you know, was the, the decision was made not to bring that to the U.S. So talk about how that decision came about and why uh, that, that, you know, that vehicle isn't being launched in the U.S. Yeah, um, it, honestly, it was with the XE, it was a fantastic, what was it, five years um, with that vehicle um, and, and still, a, still a great vehicle. Um, but I think the, the challenge we really faced was, again, where, where consumer demand was and um, where the market was going as a whole uh, for sedans. Um, and I think the beautiful thing that we were able to, to come, come through with is, I think, the, the new XF, um, which, will, which will launch early in the new year. I was going to ask about that one next, but yeah, um, <laughs> and I, I, think, I think kind of the, the XE, you can't separate the XE discussion from the XF discussion, really. Um, and it was this side of, again, listening to, to the feedback on the XE, it was, it was really the consumers there, hey, I need a little bit more rear seat space. I need a little bit more trunk space. Um, fortunately, we had the XF, which was exactly delivering that. Yeah. Um, but for a number of them at a, at a price point that wasn't kind of accessible and attainable. Um, and now with the new XF coming, it's the design exterior has been updated. The interior, almost every surface has been enhanced in terms of material qualities and design. Um, totally new um, electronic architecture and infotainment system. Um, so we've kind of amplified the XF like multiple notches um, and at the same time been able to improve the value of it in, uh, tremendously um, to the point that the, the for 21, you can get an XF with, at almost the same value as what the XE was. Mm. So it turned into this situation of, Hey, we can offer the consumer more of what they want and need out of the through the XF at a price point that's nearly at the same as what the XE was at. And at that point, it's kind of like the no-brainer of, hey, let's give the consumers what they really want and need out of the XF, um, inclusive of that that value and the, that attainability, um, in order to really kind of serve uh, those consumers that that are continue to be very interested in driving sedans. Well, as a you know, as a product expert, um, I'm curious in your perspective on why consumers have gone to the, the SUV platform, if you call it, you know, even smaller SUVs. I mean, we're getting into the point where, you know, some of these SUVs, they're compact SUVs. They look like compact cars. They're just jacked up a little bit higher. <laughs> you know, it's like, what is it that is driving that 
SUV demand that we're we've kind of gone away from cars. I just think it's or sedans. I just think it's kind of an interesting uh, it's an interesting evolution. And I'm not sure. Do you have any insight into why that evolution is happening? Yeah, and, and I think it's an evolution. Um, I, I think I always smirk a little bit um, where when it comes up that the kind of like the, the sedans dead or anything like that, because right. there's still a tremendous amount of sedans being sold every single year. Um, yeah. So so the idea that sedans are dead is um, it's it, it always makes me laugh a little bit. Um, the the reality is, I think for <clears throat> we're we're we hit this breaking point where SUVs are outselling sedans now. Um, for a lot of our consumers, it, it's come down to those people wanting that a little bit elevated seating position, um, mm -hmm. which I think obviously in in the North American market becomes important when you have such a large presence of full size pickups and SUVs on the road as well. Um, and so for a lot of people, it's that comfort level of sitting a little bit higher um, versus down at the wheel wells of those vehicles. Um, so I think that's kind of <laughs> well here in South yeah. Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't drive a block without lifted, you know, exactly. So, so for some people, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think for some people, it's that comfort level. Um, we know for some it's ingress egress um, as with, with some of the, some of our older consumers it's just having that that easier um kind of seat height to get in and out of um for some it's just convenience as far as the the trunk space and and kind of how easily they can get things in and out of it um versus in a sedan um but then you have the flip side of, of all those people that still love sedans coupes convertibles where it is it's like you still can't beat the style the design um, the, the, the street presence of, of a fantastic and, and extremely well-designed car. Mm -hmm. Um, and the sedan can still deliver a lot of that functionality that people want and need. Um, so I, I think it just, again, it goes down to, to personal taste, preference and needs. Um, and that's kind of where we see the, the XF remaining critical within our lineup, um, going forward, even if it, it means it's not selling at the same volume as an F-Pace um, and, and that sedans might not be at that same volume as, as crossovers or SUVs, but mm -hmm. it's that it's really that balance of, hey, we've got a lot of people in this country that all have different tastes. How do we how do we best serve those tastes? Absolutely. So uh, two last questions. Uh, first question is uh, our audience, our, our target audience, our retail salespeople um, who are in the trenches every day selling vehicles. What what's the one thing you want them to know about the process of bringing the product to market that maybe doesn't get as well communicated as you'd like from, you know, from your perspective? What what would you like to tell them? Um, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I the best one to the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's like one of the most difficult questions ever because there's there's so there's so many considerations at play. Um, I think I think most important, and I I feel like I've almost overused the word through our, through our time together. It it's it's about the it's the about the customer. It's about the user um, trying to deliver for what they want most of all. Um, so, and, and I know at, at times that means it's not going to suit our personal tastes. Um, but it's for, it's for the person that's actually the buying the vehicle at the end of the day, um, that it delivers for them. Um, and, and I think to, to make that happen, it's that side of taking all those other things into account. Um, and kind of that side of, of, even from our, our retailer partners and all their salespeople, like keeping the communication flow going. Um, like at the end of the day, they are closest to the customer on a on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. um, and I, a lot of them have the the absolute best pulse of of what their communities and consumers want as well. Um, so it's kind of just having that as a constant flow and constant input um, into everything that we're doing too. Awesome. And then my last question, uh, no, I have one more question after that, but my last <laughs> question is, uh, what do you drive? What's your, what's your daily and, and what's your dream car? Yeah. The, the daily now is a, a defender. Um, yeah, so, nice. yeah. <laughs> Lucky. 
<laughs> so so happy enough to be driving one of those. Very cool. And is that your dream car? I mean, if you had, if you could have any car, uh, what what would it be? Yeah, no, I I have to go back in the archives. It'd be a Dino. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, excellent. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, uh, we really appreciate you being on uh, the show. Um, uh, if you uh, want to get in touch with you, what would you do? I mean, are you on LinkedIn and you're on Twitter? I mean, if, if somebody wanted to reach out and, you know, tell them your mind. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> but, but where are you uh, on the, the social platforms? Yeah, I, I mostly stick stick to, to LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn. I don't, right? I, don't, I don't think there's too many people out there that want to hear what I have to say tweeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't figure out. Twitter I think my fan base would be low, so it's <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, Rob, uh, it was absolutely a pleasure having you on the show. Really appreciate your time. Uh, so, thank you for being a part of our podcast. Uh, podcast listeners, uh, if uh, you want to talk and join the conversation. Uh, this will be out there on social media. Please uh, make some comments um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Until next time, I'm David Stringer and this has been Next Up Accessories where we connect your next up and vehicle personalization. So every car deal every day. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>